2 Chronicles chapter 7, if you'd go there. We'll look at a familiar passage in just a minute. 2 Chronicles 7, Ronald Reagan said, To preserve our blessed land, we must look to God. It is time to realize that we need God more than He needs us. God can raise up another United States. It's time to realize we need God more than he needs us. We also have his promise that we could take to heart with regard to our country that if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and will heal their land. End of quote. So Ronald Reagan said, you know, we were the second. England was us. God raised up us because England would not follow and obey him. God could raise up someone else. God does not need us. We need him. And uh, some insight there, some wisdom. No doubt about that. You know, prayer and governing the United States of America have been forever forged together through fiery trials in America. Prayer and our nation. You read history. You know what happened in Boston there when British troops were attacking before our war for independence? The response of the legislative leadership was to bow in intercessory prayer when they heard. <laughs> they humbly petitioned the author of liberty for his protection and providential guidance. At critical moments throughout our nation's history, America's leaders have called on people to pray. They've called for Congress, have proclaimed days of prayer and prayer and fasting in our nation. Think of that throughout the land. During one of the first congressional sessions, the legislative leaders prayed for hours through Psalm 35. For hours they prayed through that psalm. There's no other way to explain why America won the independence from Great Britain than that God intervened on our behalf. He answered the prayers of patriots and leaders that wanted to please him with all their heart and they wanted the freedom to do that. The story of prayer in America is one of the most remarkable aspects in world history. Prayer played a critical role in preserving America through trying times and preparing her to become a world leader for the elevation and welfare of the spiritual and civic liberty of mankind. We've seen that in our nation. God prepared us for things that was coming in history in this world and has used our nation in a powerful way. I'm going to read you a couple of prayers and a couple of these things I'm going to read are lengthy, so you have to discipline yourself to listen and focus in, but and the Lord help you and be encouraged by this. World War II, numerous examples of a, we have numerous examples of a nation at prayer. Perhaps the most famous instance of prayer is the troops was circulated a prayer by General George Patton, December 1942. In the interview with ch the chaplain brigadier general, James O'Neill, General Patton confided, confided, Chaplain, I'm a strong believer in prayer. We were lucky in Africa and Sicily and in Italy simply because people prayed. But we have to pray for ourselves too. A good soldier is not made merely by making him think and work. There's something in every soldier that goes deeper than thinking or working. It's his guts. It is something that he has built in there. It is a world of truth and power that is higher than himself. Great living is not all output of thought and work. A man has to have intake as well. I don't know what you call it, but I call it religion, prayer, or God. We've got to get not only the chaplains, but every man in the third army to pray. We must ask God to stop these reins. These reins are the margin that holds defeat or victory. I believe that prayer completes the circuit. It is power. <laughs> That's what General Patton told him. So on December 11th and 12th, 3,200 training letters on prayer were distributed to every chaplain and organizational commander down to and including the regimental level, and 250,000 prayer cards were distributed to every soldier in the Third Army with the now famous what's called Patton's Prayer. Almighty, here's the prayer. 
Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee of thy great goodness to restrain these immoderate rains with which we have had to contend. Grant us fair weather for battle. Graciously hearken to us as soldiers who call upon thee that armed with thy power we may advance from victory to victory and crush the oppression and wickedness of our enemies and establish thy justice among men and nations. Amen. The chaplain reported that on December 20, to the consternation of the Germans and the delight of the American forecasters who were equally surprised at the turnabout, the rains and the fogs ceased. For the better part of a week came bright, clear skies and perfect flying weather. Our planes came over by tens and hundreds and thousands, able to do what they needed to do. Our president throughout World War II was FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He took his oath of office on Saturday, March 4th, 1933, and he prayed in his address as he addressed in his oath of office. This is what he said. In this dedication of a nation, we humbly ask the blessings of God. May he protect each and every one of us. May he guide me in the days to come. Roosevelt's most famous prayer would come, though, 11 years later. D-Day, World War II, June 7th, 1944. He asked his fellow Americans to join him in prayer for American troops facing the most difficult battle of World War II. As people gather around the radios for his famous fireside chats, Roosevelt prayed, and here's what he prayed. My fellow Americans, last night when I spoke with you about the fall of Rome, I knew at the, that moment the troops of the United States and our allies were crossing the channel in another and great operation. It has come to pass with success thus far, and so in this poignant hour, I ask you to join me in prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity, lead them straight and true, give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. They will need thy blessings. Their road will be long and hard, for the enemy is strong. He may hurl back our forces. Success may not come with rushing speed, but we shall return again and again. And we know that by thy grace and by the righteousness of our cause, our sons will triumph. They will be night and day without rest until the victory. The darkness will be rent by noise and flame. Men's souls will be shaken with the violences of war, for these men are lately drawn from the ways of peace. They fight not for the lust of conquest. They fight to end conquest. They fight to liberate. They fight to let justice arise and tolerance and goodwill among all thy people. They yearn but for the end of the battle, for the return to the haven of home. Some will never return. Embrace these, Father. Receive them, thy heroic servants, into thy kingdom. And for us at home, fathers, mothers, children, wives, sister, and brother of brave men overseas whose thoughts and prayers are ever with them, help us, almighty God, to rededicate ourselves to renewed faith in thee in this hour of great sacrifice. Many have urged that I call this nation to a single day of special prayer. But because the road is long, the desire is great, I ask that our people devote themselves in a continuance of prayer. As we rise to each new day, and again when each day is spent, let words of prayer be on our lips, invoking thy help to our efforts. Give us strength to... Strengthen our daily task. Redouble the contributions we make in the physical and material support of our armed forces. Let our hearts be stout to wait out the long travail, to bear sorrows that may come, to impart our courage to our sons wheresoever they may be. And, O oh Lord, give us faith. Give us faith in Thee, faith in our sons, faith in each other, faith in our united crusade. Let not the keenness of our spirit ever be dull. Let not the impact of temporary events, of temporal matters, of but fleeting moments, let not these deter us in our unconquerable purpose. With thy blessings, we shall prevail over the unholy forces of our enemy. Help us to conquer the apostles of greed and racial arrogances. Lead us to the saving of our country and with our sister nations into a world unity that will spell a sure peace, a peace invulnerable to the unintelligible of unworthy men, and a peace that will let all men live in freedom reaping the just rewards of their honest fight. Thy will be done, Almighty God. Amen. Look, you may not agree with every policy of some of these men. I'm just saying prayer has shaped our nation. 
And we found as Christians so often now that we don't pray. Our government certainly is not going to pray, unfortunately. Not unless something awful, crises hits our nation. We've tried to ban God from everything. And I know you may be thinking, well, well what, what good? What could my prayers, my service, my witnessing do? I, I'm a nobody. Well, we studied Andrew not long ago, the apostle, who faded into the background in the shadow of his brother Peter. But God used him in a mighty way. And so, the mighty elements of prayer have shaped America's character. They've guided her path from her inception to this present day. Prayer has girded America's military. Prayer. Prayer has filled the hearts of Americans with hope and courage. It's given Americans the will to continue in dark days. Today, in this world of trouble and turmoil, prayer must be the anchor to keep us holding fast to the principles that made this nation great. Prayer can't be relegated to some few. It must not be something we read about in books. It must be something we practice continually. Let us remember, God divinely intervened in the nations of Israel. We read about this morning, 2 Kings, there what God did with Hezekiah. God intervened when Abraham pled with him about his nephew Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. Moses, remember, interceded for the nation of Israel and God was going to destroy them for their sin and God heard and helped. And although the apathy of some Christians and the wickedness of American society are discouraging, we should pray. We should remain confident in our God that He will answer prayer. He will. May we return to the biblical standard of prayer for our embattled nation. And through intercessory prayer, might we see the hand of God's divine intervention. We need to pray. How often we've complained and when we should have been praying. We've complained about things in our nation. We've complained about things about our leaders. But have we prayed for them? It's like our children, you know. Sometimes we want to get on to them about things, but have we taught them what to do with the right thing? And we want to get on to them about not doing something, but have we showed them how to do it? And in our nation... Can we complain about the leadership we have if we've not prayed that God would give us the right type? If we've not asked God to guide these leaders, if we've not done our part, God commands us to pray for those in authority over us. Second Chronicles chapter 7, if you found your place there, the Bible says in verse 12, the Lord appeared to Solomon. Now what's happened is they've just dedicated the temple. and They've offered all these sacrifices and they've cried out to God in verse 1 of chapter 7, at the end of his praying of Solomon, that fire came down from heaven. The glory of the Lord filled the house. Chapter 7, verse 1. And now God appears and speaks to Solomon directly at night. The Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer. And again, it challenged me. If God said that to you and me today, what prayer did he hear? Did he hear us cry out to him for our nation? hear us cry out to him for our family, for our own personal walk with him? Have we sought the Lord like a heart panting after the water brook, that deer that's thirsty? He said, I heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locust to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. Verse 14, if my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be open. Hallelujah. And mine ears attend unto the prayer, notice again, the prayer that is made in this place, for now I have chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. And as for thee, if thou wilt walk before me as David, thy father, and he continues on. Oh, I love that as David. David had a heart for God. But remember, in this day, there is no temple where God dwells. The temple of God is now not a building. It's the hearts of his people. And God says, when people cry out, my people, I'll hear them. My ear is a tent to their cry. My eyes are on them. And so this great 
passage that we talk about many times, we think of revival. How can we as Americans pray effectively? And I'm going to give you a list of verses to pray. But we see there's need of healing in our land. We need these things that he gives at the end. We need him to hear. We need him to forgive. We need him to heal us. And God gives us a way to call out on him that we find in the word of God. I'm going to give you a list. And like I said, you might want to write them down. Before we do, I just want to look at two aspects of this verse, verse 14. I want you to see, first of all, the word if. The very first word, if. It shows us that the children of God must do some things. If, my people. First of all, which are called by my name. So it's got to be those that are Christians. Those that are called by his name. God's children. If, first of all, shall humble themselves. Now that goes against everything in our current culture, in our generation, in our America that we live in, to humble ourselves. But God says that is the first thing. If we will humble ourselves. We talked about that last week. We talked about poor in spirit, that God resisteth the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6. But he also said it in James 4, 6. Let me read it to you. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. He will give grace to the humble, and he will resist the proud. So humble ourselves. Now that shows that the children of God, this if shows the children of God must pray. We must pray. And I've made that emphasis today, but think of that. How much time have we spent praying? You say, I've spent hours this week praying. Hallelujah. I'm so glad to hear that. But are we praying? He says we must pray. Pray. Humble themselves and pray. See, prayer is obeying God. Prayer is talking to him. He says over and over to continue, Colossians 4, 2, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Think of that. Then he says, Luke 21, 36, watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man, Luke 21, 36. And then he says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek God's face. Seek my face. God's people must seek his face. Seeking God's face is a daily commitment. It's a daily commitment. Isaiah 58, 2, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that is righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Remember, Jesus would say, ask, ask, and you shall receive. Seek, you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. God is looking for those that will ask, that will seek, that will knock, that will desire him. We must determine to pray for our nation. We must determine to pray for his mercy. Either we will pray for our nation by determination or there'll come a day we will pray out of desperation. I'd much rather not get to that day. May we determine to pray, to seek God's face. Then he says, lastly, turn from their wicked ways. Now this we have to get. These are God's people. If my people, which are called by my name, well, if they're God's people, certainly they don't do any Wicked ways, they don't have any sin, right? None of you have any wicked ways, right? But God, he knows his sheep all too well, doesn't he? God says there's going to be some wicked ways we're going to have to turn from. Uh, we're going to have to let him push down on the rod as we pass under the rod, as we just studied Psalm 23 in our Bible study. And literally, that's what David was saying when he said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Look under the surface, Lord. Press down under my wool and see on the skin there. Is, there. is there a cut deep down? Is there something? That's what the shepherd would do is he'd press down the wool. He would see if there's a disease. He would see if there was something that needs some ointment on it, some oil on it, something. We need God. Lord, search me. Know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Turn. From their wicked ways. That word turn is the same word we use the word repent. That's what turn means. That's what repent means, to turn from. Turn from that wicked way and turn again back to God's way. Remember what the Bible said in Psalm 66, 18. You're wasting your time to pray otherwise. He said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And so we must pray. So then the word then comes. 
And so these are the two aspects. We have the if, that's God's people's responsibility. But then the then, that shows that God will do. First of all, he'll hear from heaven. He'll hear from heaven. God answers prayer. Aren't you glad for that? Call unto me and I'll answer thee. Show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. Jeremiah 33, 3. Matthew 21, 22. In all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. He says, call unto me. God answers prayer. He'll hear from heaven. Secondly, he said, then I'll forgive I'll, and will forgive their sin. Aren't you glad? He'll forgive our sin. You'll turn from that wicked way. If I repent, he'll forgive. God is a God of mercy. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy. And to all them that call upon thee, Psalm 86, 5. Plenteous in mercy. <laughs> I need some of that plenteous, don't we? And then third, he says, God will heal their land. God's divine intervention through our prayerful intercession is the hope for America. That's what we need. Will we pray? Well, how should I pray? Well, let me give you, as we think tonight of this topic, the patriot prayer. The patriot's prayer. Or the prayer of patriots, however you want to write it. Prayer of patriots. The scripture, these are scriptural prayers. These are prayers right from the word of God, addressed to the Lord. We start, first of all, with recognizing where we are. Dear Lord, we know that America is under three country curses. For the sins of, number one, abortion, which you've stated in your word that you will not pardon. You want to write these verses down? Jeremiah 2, 34. Also in thy skirts is found the blood of the souls of the poor innocents. 2 Kings 24, 4. And also for the innocent blood that he shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. For time's sake, I'll give you some references that I won't read. Here's one, Isaiah 49, 1. Then Jeremiah 1, 5, we looked at in Sunday school. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet of the nations. And then I'll give you this. I won't read Psalm 139, 13 and 14. But God says that abortion is the killing of the innocents. Unbelievable, the statistic gave in the Bible study group this morning, but 60 million we've killed in America since Roe versus Wade. 60 million. But in the world since 1980, 1 1.5 billion. That's another fourth almost of our population. Think of that. These are the innocents. This is an abomination to God. We need his forgiveness for those sins. The second Sin, we must admit, is our alternate lifestyles that challenge traditional family values. Genesis 13, 13, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Genesis 19, 24, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Only time that's ever happened on a city. And Jude 1, 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. See, God said there were an example to all those after. They're set forth in this example. God hates the sin of sodomy. Fornication, he's mentioning here as well. Now, the same answer is they need the Lord. We understand that. Just like any sinner. Romans 1, 26, 27, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir which was meat. The third sin is turning our back on the nation of Israel. Genesis 12, 3, I won't read. Psalm 122, 6 says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, they shall prosper that love thee. Zechariah 2, 8. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. For he that toucheth you touches the apple of his eye. Galatians 3, 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. And so here's our prayers. Number one, pray 
Our nation deserves judgment, but we ask you for your forgiveness and mercy. So we have to be honest. Lord, our nation deserves judgment. But we ask for forgiveness and mercy. Isaiah 1, 4, ah, sinful nation. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel into anger. They are gone away backward. Jeremiah 7, 28, But thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obeyeth not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. Psalm 86, 15, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion. Hallelujah. And gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. Psalm 103, 8, I won't read if you want to write that one down. Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Luke eleven four. 4. Again, I won't read that one for time. Number two, Lord, forgive our nation for the sin of idolatry and for turning our hearts away from you, the only true and living God. Jeremiah 10, 10, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. Jeremiah 25, 6, and go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands and I will do you no hurt. Ezekiel 16, 6, repent and turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. Hosea 8, 11 is another. Acts 17, 16 says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry, and we are a nation given to idolatry. From what's in our wallet, to the truck that we want, to the house that we want, to the lake house we want, to the job, to the power, to the name, to the followers, to the you name it. We are worshiping, bowing down to so many other gods. You say, I don't see anyone bowing down. Anything that takes God's place is an idol. Nothing can take God's place. And people that aren't in church Sunday because they've got to work, they're making the money. And some have to work. There's some necessary things of nursing and policing. There's some things that are necessary. But many things that we, we're, we're too busy. Oh, I don't have time for God because it's become an idol. We've even named shows American Idol. And Christian people watching can't wait to find out who wins. And we had a lady at a church in, our church in Kentucky. She was honest. She said, I'm sorry, I can't come to church that night because American Idol is on. I appreciate her honesty. But we've become a nation of idols in so many ways. We worship the new phone. I mean, just you name it. This has become what our life is about. This is what our energy and passion is about. Hosea 8.11, I think I mentioned Acts 17.16, 1 Corinthians 10.14. And I'll read you 1 Thessalonians 1.9, For they themselves show, us, show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how we, ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. The third prayer, Lord, forgive our nation for being a forgetful people. Forgive our nation for being forgetful. Deuteronomy 32.18 of the rock. That begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Jeremiah 3.21, for they have perverted their way, and they have forgotten the Lord their God. Isaiah 46.9, remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Hosea 13.6, according to their pasture, so they were filled. So were they filled. They were filled. And their heart was exalted. Therefore have they forgotten me. The fourth prayer, Lord, for protect our nation from our enemies and deliver us from evil within and without. Who would have thought we'd come today to see how the FBI is now, uh, the corruption, we don't know which way is up. And other agencies now and investigations that are special on top of that. And it's just become a circus. These things that were once trusted, you could believe that they were right and would do right. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Joshua 1, 9. Proverbs 28, 1. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. 
They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Protect our nation from our enemies. Deliver us from evil within and without. Isaiah 41.10. John 14.27. John 16.33. 2 Corinthians 4.8.9. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Titus, excuse me, 2 Timothy 3.1. Ephesians 6, 13 says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all to stand. 1 Peter 3, 14, But and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Fifthly, as we pray, spare our nation, Lord, for the sake of the very small remnant of faithful believers in you. Isaiah 1, 9 says, Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Sixth, help our nation to turn to righteousness, postponing your judgment. Righteousness exalts the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people, Proverbs 14, 34. Jeremiah 18, 8, If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Jeremiah 26, 13, Therefore now amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will repent him of the evil that he hath pronounced against you. Jonah 3, 10, And God saw their works, and they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Oh, Lord, help our nation to turn to righteousness, postponing your judgment. Number seven, help us to be more informed, to be more involved, and to intercede in prayer for our nation. 1 Chronicles 12, 32, And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. Luke 18, 1, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, 18, Pray without ceasing, and everything gives thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Number 8, Lord, awaken us from our complacency. Move us to action. Challenge us and give us a renewed vision and a burden for our country. Illuminate our minds and hearts. Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. 1 Corinthians 15, 34, awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Americans, there are Americans that don't know God. Never heard the gospel, never heard Jesus Christ except associated with a curse word in our country, in our state, probably in our county right here. Paul said I, to the church of Corinth, I speak this to your shame, to my shame. Ephesians 1.18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Number nine, help us to shine as lights in the world and renew a fire within our hearts that we will burn brightly for you. Forgive us for being lukewarm. Philippians 2, 15, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and first nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Hebrews 1, 7. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Revelation 3, 15, 16, I know thy works. Thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. Our lukewarmness makes God sick. Tenth, we want to stand in the gap, Lord, for our country so you will not destroy it. Ezekiel 22, 30, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. 11, help us to be the salt of the earth. Matthew 5, 13, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salt? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of men. Number 12, Lord, please bring our nation back to where you can bless us. Make us blessable, Lord. Psalm 33, 12, I shared tonight, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord 
the people whom he had chosen for his own inheritance. Proverbs 29, 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Number 13, help our nation to be people of understanding and knowledge so you can prolong our peace, prosperity, and liberty. Proverbs 28, 2, for the transgression of a land, many are the princes thereof. But by a man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. Proverbs 28, 2. 14, we know our future looks dark, but we know you still sit on the throne of eternity, and with you all things are possible. Psalm 11, 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. Lamentation 5, 19, thou, O Lord, remainest forever. Thy throne from generation to generation. Mark 10, 27. And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. 15. We know you are the ruler over all the earth and in control of our very lives. We pray for thy will to be done. He ruleth by his power forever. His eyes behold the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Psalm 66, 7. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Psalm 103, 19, Matthew 6, 10. 16, Lord, help us to put our trust in you. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. Psalm 5, 11. What time I am afraid. I'll trust in thee. Psalm 56, 3. Psalm 56, 11. In God have I put my trust. I'll not be afraid what man can do unto me. Psalm 56, 11. Psalm 118, 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Nahum 1, 7. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I won't read. Many of you know that by heart. Verse uh, number 17, just two more after this one. Stir us to get involved in government, to see it as a call from you. We need people who are govern our nation by biblical principles, who fear you, and who stand up for what is right. 2 Samuel 23, 3. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me, He that ruleth over me, men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Exodus 18, 21, moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Number 18, thank you for America, as it is still the greatest nation on earth. Thank you for our freedom. Thank you for our liberty and justice. 2 Corinthians 3, 17, now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Galatians 5, 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Number 19, help us to watch and pray. Pray return and allow us to occupy until you come. Luke 19, 13 says, Occupy till I come. Mark 13, 33, Take heed. Watch and pray, for you know not what, when the time is. Luke 21, 36, watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. John 9, 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And James 1, 25, but whoso looketh in the perfect law of liberty, Continue therein, he be not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. So we conclude tonight. We think of how we need to pray. I want to share this morning the rest of the story, this evening as I shared this morning, the rest of the short story about Hugh Latimer. He was martyred in 1555 with Mr. Ridley by that Catholic Queen Bloody Mary, Queen of England. And Hugh Latimer was known as the terror of evildoers, the idol of the common people, and the most honest man in England. He and Bishop Ridley were in the forefront of the Protestant movement in England. 
By sheer force of character, Latimer raised himself from a plowman's cottage to a bishop's palace. When Bloody Mary took the throne, many just like him changed their coat. Uh, they were no longer Anglican. They became Catholic, if you get what I'm saying. But Latimer refused to change his coat. And so many others did. They changed it. People who heard him preach fell under the spell of his eloquence, they said. For years he'd been a champion of Rome as a priest. But afterward he became, for the true cause of Christ, a champion for Christ. Hugh Latimer was led to the Lord by a nobody. I wanted to share this when I preached on Andrew. He was one of God's magnific magnificent, insignificant Andrews. One that faded in the background. I'm giving this to you tonight because you say, what can we do with this great nation? God could use you to be like this man. Little Billney was his name. <laughs> See, Andrew was always bringing people to Christ. That's what I preached about when we talked about him. He was characterized as the Lord's disciple that brought people to Jesus. But there's a man in Cambridge in the days when Latimer was still Rome's champion, Roman Catholic Church, whose name was Thomas Billney. He's a man of no account. That's what they said about him. They called him Little Billney. He came to Christ by reading the New Testament. He coveted the soul of Hugh Latimer for Jesus. He wanted to see Latimer get saved. Nobody paid much attention to Little Billney, but he thought if he could win Latimer to the Lord, he could sway the multitudes. He had such eloquence in preaching. So one day, Little Billney went to the church where Latimer was preaching. He, cost, he accosted the popular preach, priest after on his way down the aisle. Please, Father Latimer, may I confess my soul to you? Which was a request in the Catholic Church that could not be denied. And they went into the confessional, and that day, Hugh Latimer heard a confession the like of which he had never heard before. Little Billney told of the coming of Erasmus. He told of the purchase of a book. He told Talking about the New Testament. He told of the hunger of his heart. Father Latimer, he said, I went to the priest. They pointed me to broken cisterns. They told me to do penance, to do mass, to do good works. These things only mocked at my soul's deep need. I bore the load of my sins. I was crushed beneath them. Then the light of the scripture burst into my soul. <laughs> I read, this is a faithful saying, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then and there I was saved. Latimer that day was taken by storm and he gave his heart to Christ. The popular Roman priest had been won by one of God's illustrious nobodies, Little Billney, one of the many Andrews that God puts into his harvest field. I wanted to share that story with you for this purpose. We heard this morning what Hugh Latimer did and how they lit a candle in England that never could be put out. And that was their prayer. and They were burned at the stake. But it never would have happened if it wasn't for this little Billney. Someone that went after one soul for Christ. Say, God wants to use us to pray for our country. God wants to use us to turn the tide in our country. It will happen by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's bow in prayer.